Okay, in this quick lesson, what we're going to talk about today is sound uh, and sound waves. So really the physics of sound waves. Okay, what are sound waves? It'd be good to take notes on this stuff just so that you have it, uh, have it down. So sound is caused when vibrations are created from a source. These vibrations cause air particles to collide with one another, producing what we know as longitudinal waves. As you can see, it's written there. As a result, sound waves require material medium through which to travel. So in all of our discussion prior to today, uh, we've always talked about um, the fact that when you speak, you vibrate your vocal cords. And when you vibrate your vocal cords, you vibrate the air. And when you vibrate the air, you send sound waves out to other people who then it enters their ear, vibrates their eardrum, and they can convert that uh, the vibrations on the eardrum into sound um, that your, your your brain can interpret through electrical signals. But how it travels is through a material medium. This example down below just has a, a spring system. You can see if these are particles of air, a wave or a, a particle bumping into another particle causes this wave to propagate through through the air. Now it does propagate at a very specific speed, and we'll talk about that speed later, uh, depending on the air temperature and the humidity and all these other factors that, that come into play. But the big thing is, is that longitudinal waves um, carry this, this sound wave. Uh, waves require the material medium because the air particles have to collide with something, and you need to vibrate the air in order to get it to produce the sound waves. Creating sound, all right. So you see here we have a tuning fork. And the tines on the tuning fork, when you ding it, it'll go hmm. And what happens is those tines vibrate. And the way they vibrate, they actually push the air, as you can see here. You get areas of compression where the particles are close together. And you get areas of rarefaction where the particles are far apart or rarefied. So it says here that you know, based on the, 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 the shape and the mass and the material which these tuning forks are made out of, they all vibrate at very specific frequencies: 256 hertz, 3, you know, 1024 hertz, uh, 512 hertz, uh, different frequencies. And you can make them any frequency you want, really. And uh, now that has something to do with something called resonance, and we'll, we'll get to that later. But uh, for now, just realizing that um, using a tuning fork or any sort of source to vibrate uh, air is a good way to produce these sound waves. And you can see how they propagate through the air here. Okay, here's your vocal cords. Now I am gonna have to open this up uh, in YouTube here and you'll see. So here's vocal cords uh, and when they're vibrating, they vibrate the air at the same frequency at which the vocal cords are vibrating. Now they've got a stroboscope in here. So the stroboscope is making it so that you can actually see the vibrations in slow motion. Now, the vocal cords here, as you can see them, uh, these are healthy, they're, they're sort of whitish color. Um, if you get sick, for instance, uh, these will often get inflamed, uh, and when they're inflamed, it changes the frequency of, the vo of your voice. Uh, if you get mucus forming on here, uh, and all kinds of things like that, what it does is it makes the, these uh, vocal cords heavier. And when they're heavier, they vibrate at a different frequency, and they're harder to actually get to resonate at the frequency that you want. Um, so, although it sounds disgusting, it's what happens. And you can see the trachea below, and you're blowing the air from your lungs, which causes the vibration. Uh, if you put, you know, put two pieces of grass together and, and blow through it, or blow through your thumbs, and you can see that you can produce that same sort of uh, those same sounds, those same frequencies. So your vocal cords by tightening them or loosening them you can change the frequency at which they vibrate which then in turn changes the frequency at which the air vibrates and you're and you're you know passing the energy through uh, through the air to other people and things like that if you get really sick and you get laryngitis for instance uh, then what you can end up happening is these vocal cords become so damaged or so or so injured that what happens is they become almost flaccid they're just sort of like you know barely moving they're it's like a, a but, um, you know, you've really got this situation where uh, they're loose and they actually can't vibrate anymore. And so what ends up happening is you can only talk in whispers because you have to whisper just to get the air to make sound uh, because your vocal cords aren't tight enough to actually like vibrate properly. It'd be like taking a guitar string, which is, uh, you know, really, really taut and really like under high tension and then just 
un, un, like loosen it up completely so it's just like a string and you try and pluck it and you get no sound coming out of it so that's basically what you what you get when that happens okay so um, you know again sound waves are longitudinal waves you can see here's the speaker that vibrates we've made speakers in this course and as the speakers vibrate they push air and you get areas of uh, compression and rarefaction a wavelength is measured from two compression zones or the middle of two rarefaction zones and as it goes it reaches your ear and your ear vibrates at the same frequency at which these pressure waves are reaching you so when a pressure wave reaches you it, ding, it clicks your uh, your eardrum um, we'll talk about the ear later on and exactly how that happens okay so the analogies here of a sound as a pressure wave you can see here that you know you've got compression zone, the rarefaction zone, and you can see here how this might represent, you know, it's not exactly correct, this is a pressure versus time graph. So high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. Um, so really it's not a transverse wave, it's a longitudinal wave, and what you'll see is there's high pressures and low pressure, and the low pressure is the rarefaction zone, and what you'll see is like that's what's causing that, that's what you, when you hear the frequency, you're hearing those those high compression zones smacking into your eardrum and you know if it's a high frequency they're hitting you very rapidly if it's a low frequency they're hitting you less frequently and that's also related to the wavelength because we do know that because the speed of sound is constant in a given temperature of air that if you increase the frequency you will decrease the wavelength and vice versa if you decrease the frequency and get a low sound the wavelength's bigger and therefore there these compression waves are hitting your ear less frequently the bell jar experiment okay so you know what happens um, just to show that if you are have a, a vacuum here that's that's got a bell ringing in it and you evacuate it pull all the air out of it what would happen here we go so this guy set up a vacuum pump you can hear clearly the bell. Now he's evacuating the pump, he's pulling the air out. And you notice that the sound is becoming less prevalent. He's gonna keep evacuating it. Now the one thing you can't do is, you know, this bell is attached to the, to the chamber, so this chamber is going to vibrate regardless of the fact that, you know, we pulled all the air out. Now in the past they actually thought that, before they had built vacuum pumps, they thought that if you pulled the air out of here, that the whole thing would go black, that you wouldn't actually be able to see the light from the other side, because they didn't understand whether or not light would travel through a vacuum or not which we now know is, I mean, it doesn't make sense. They pull the air out and you can still see through it, just like we can see the sun through the vacuum of space. So listen, it's dead silent. Now he's gonna let the air back in. And there you go. You can hear the bell perfectly now. So, basically, um, everything you've learned about uh, science fiction shows is incorrect, and we know that because uh, in science fiction, movies are wrong. Uh, there is no sound in space because there is no material medium through which to pass the sound waves. So let's pause this. How would sound... Wait, how would sound like, what, oh sorry, <laughs> how would Star Wars sound like in real space? Star Wars has always been more of a space fantasy than it is a sci-fi movie series. In doing so, it tends to neglect many elements that sci-fi films tend to worry about in order to seem realistic.
One of these is sound being able to be projected in space, which has always been a constant criticism held against Star Wars for its lack of realism. Welcome to Silo, where in this video we'll take a quick look on how Star Wars would have looked like had it tried to be more realistic in this sense. Considering Star Wars is possibly best known for its epic space dogfights with a blaster fire, engine and explosion sounds that can all be heard in these scenes in space. It goes without saying that these scenes will feel very different. After all, according to science, space is a vacuum, and since sound requires matter to propagate, the audience should not hear any sound. So with it all said, let's apply some scientific realism to a space dogfight in Star Wars by removing the sound and see the result. this guy. Okay, so as you can see, with no sound in space, things are very different. Things don't really, uh, you know, sound the same, literally. They literally have no sound. Uh, now you can hear inside the ship, obviously, because there is sound uh, there's air inside the ship, so when you're talking to each other inside the ship or, you know, machines are making sounds, you're going to hear that. But outside, nothing. All right, speed of sound. This is really important, so you're definitely going to want to take your notes on this. So sound travels at very specific speeds in air depending on both moisture, density, uh, and temperature of the air. Uh, it turns out that, you know, in all the terms that we would add to figure out what the speed of sound is in air, uh, we find out that temperature is really the biggest uh, biggest factor. Key point, just like we talked about for all waves, is that all frequencies of sound, regardless of what frequency it is, travel at the same speed through air. Just like all waves, regardless of what frequency or wavelength they have, they travel at the same speed if the material they're traveling through is the same. Now light, being traveling without a medium, always travels at the speed of light and every frequency or every color or every wavelength of light travels at the same speed regardless of the frequency or wavelength. That's a big, big thing to remember. It's almost the most important part of this really. So what is the relationship? Well, through a lot of work um, that was done by many different physicists over the years and we're actually going to look at some of the most ancient ways of, of discovering uh, what the speed of sound is and we're actually going to be doing an investigation where we determine the speed of sound quite accurately um, in the room that we're in like in our, in our physics lab. Uh, we've come up with this basic equation here which is the speed of sound is dependent on the prop on properties of air. The biggest contributing factor is the air temperature. So the speed of sound is 332 meters per second plus 0 0.6 times t. Now this unit here is meters per second per degree Celsius, obviously, because we need meters per second. So T is temperature. Now again, we're back to the, you know, T is for period, T is for temperature, T is for time. Like we have all these different things that we need to um, uh, think about. But in this equation, it's clearly related to the temperature of the air. You can get better, like more accurate measurements to what that 0 0.6 is, but this is a good enough approximation. So what this tells us is, if it's zero degrees outside, T equals zero, then what we end up with is the speed of sound at zero degrees Celsius, so you know, in the, in the winter time, near December-ish or whatever, we're looking at the speed being 332 meters 
per second. That means that it would, you know, it would go 332 meters in one second. So that's about, uh, you know, in three seconds, it would go about one kilometer. So it goes about a kilometer every three seconds. So if you clap your hand in three seconds, that sound would be heard by someone a kilometer away. If you fire a gun, it would take three seconds to hear it from a kilometer away. Now the bullet would get there before that, which is often, you know, you would, you would, if you were firing at something, uh, it would get hit even before the sound reached it because it's traveling at uh, supersonic speeds. So um, the speed of sound is, you know, it's not infinite. It's not, it's very fast, uh, but it's not, you know, it's not infinite by any means. It's why sometimes, you know, if you go to a big park that's, you know, a few hundred meters in, in size, uh, you could say it would take one second for you to, to hear the sound of someone made a, a sharp sound. Well, if you're playing golf, for instance, you can actually watch people that are about 300 meters away. And if they hit the ball really hard, you'll actually watch them swing because the speed of light is way, way, way faster than the speed of sound. What would end up happening is you would see them swing, they would hit the ball, and then you would see the ball in the air, and then you would hear the sound of them hitting it one second later. So there would be a discrepancy. You'd see the swing, you'd see the ball in the air a bit, and then you'd hear the sound of them hitting it. It's a very strange thing. Um, if you could, uh, if they were yelling at you, let's say, and you had binoculars and you were watching their mouth, you would actually see their mouths moving, and a second later you would hear this lag of them of the words that they're saying. So if they were yelling loud enough. Um, and again, that's if they're at 300 meters away, which is quite far away, but you could do it with binoculars and someone yelling at you. It would definitely work. Okay, so write this equation down. Speed of sound, 332. The units are meters per second, and the units for this one are meters per second per degree Celsius, and this temperature is measured in degrees Celsius. So I wrote before, you know, at zero degrees Celsius, the speed of sound is 332 meters per second. Um, at below zero temperatures, the speed is less than 332. And at above zero temperatures, the speed is greater than 332. As an exercise, what you should do now is put this on pause and calculate the speed of sound uh, at room temperature at 22 degrees Celsius. And all you're going to do for that is put in 22 degrees Celsius for the temperature, figure out the speed of sound. Okay. Speed of sound calculations, like rearranging that formula is quite straightforward. We'll do some examples of it um, just to help you out with uh, figuring out how to, how to use it. But the next most important thing is something called the Mach number. Uh, this is uh, developed by a gentleman named Ernst Mach. He was a physicist and he came up with a, you know, he's famous for this number, which is a ratio of the speed of an object compared to the speed of sound. So for example, or sorry, that is, you know, if you have Mach 1, that is the speed of sound. So an object traveling at Mach 1, let's say you have Super Turtle, and Super Turtle is moving at Mach 1. Well, that means he's moving at the speed of sound. If he's traveling at Mach 2, that means it's two times the speed of sound. Mach 3, three times the speed of sound. I think you get the idea. Now, if he's traveling at Mach 0 0.5, that means he's moving at half the speed of sound. Okay. Now, if you're traveling at a speed less than the speed of sound, that's called subsonic. If you're traveling at the speed of sound, that's called super, that's called uh, you're moving at sonic temperatures, or so, sorry, sonic speeds. If you're moving at faster than the speed of sound, so Mach 1 or higher, you're moving at what are called supersonic speeds. So basically the the you know it's very simple to think about supersonic is when you're traveling faster than the speed of sound so above Mach 1 subsonic is when you're moving uh, less than Mach 1 so you're moving at not at the speed of sound and there's even hypersonic and you can look up hypersonic as well that's when you're moving even you know at a, at a Mach number much greater than that and you can actually look up what the value of the hypersonic range is okay you can calculate it like so, Mach number equals the object speed divided by the speed of sound. So you take the V and divide it by the speed of the object and divide it by the speed of sound and that ratio is our Mach number. So it's measured in uh, no units because you have meters per second over meters per second. They divide out and you just get a number. Obviously the, you know, and the other thing to note about this that's really important is that the speed of sound is dependent on temperature. 
So your Mach number changes depending on where you are. So an object could be traveling at Mach 1 near the surface of the Earth. You know, so they could be traveling at Mach 1. Um, well, okay, let's say they're up in the atmosphere somewhere and it's really cold. The speed of sound is slower. So if they're traveling at some speed and then the speed of sound is lower because they're at a, high t a low temperature, they could be traveling at Mach 1 or Mach 2, let's say. As they move down into the atmosphere, they may keep their speed the same, their actual speed, but the temperature of the air is increasing, which means that the speed of sound is increasing. Now, if the speed of sound is increasing and their speed hasn't changed, their Mach number starts to drop. So you can actually maintain a constant speed, but your Mach number can fluctuate. And your Mach number will fluctuate because the speed of sound is dependent on the temperature. So it's really important that you recognize the fact that you know, the Mach number is variable depending on the temperature of air. So that no matter what, even if you haven't changed your speed, your Mach number could change if, you, if the air temperature around you has changed. There are you know, similar analogies if you're talking about uh, you know, what, what a Mach number looks like if you're traveling in water, for instance, because there's a, a, a speed of water waves and you can talk about a boat traveling through it and whether or not it's traveling at sub water wave speed or super water wave speed or right at the speed of the waves of the water. So there are other analogies that work for this as well. We'll do some examples of these problems as well. Show a video of planes breaking the sound barrier. Okay, so the, these uh, supersonic jets are going to fly. So it says here, you know, this is in miles per hour. Okay, so what you can see here is that when the plane breaks the speed of sound, which means that it uh, reaches the sound barrier, the sound barrier is Mach, at Mach 1 year you've reached the sound barrier, and when you pass the sound barrier, you break the speed of sound. Uh, that's the speed at which you uh, are going faster than the speed of sound. At that point, the air pressure uh, around the, the ship due to all these like eddy currents, because you're basically ripping through the air at that point. The sound waves can't even catch up to the plane. They're going so fast. The plane is going so fast that the sound waves are actually left behind it. And that causes this massive, massive buildup of pressure, a big, big pressure wave. And when you pop through it, what happens is there's a sudden drop in the air pressure. And you can see that the air, which contains water, when there's a sudden drop in the pressure, it cools the air really quickly. And when the air cools really quickly, water droplets form. And that's the water vapor. You basically make a cloud around it. And so that cloud forms for a brief second and then disappears. So the sound barrier is sort of this, this point where, you know, if the sound waves are being emitted in front of you, as you approach the, approach the speed of sound, you're actually passing, you're going faster than the sound waves you're making. And if you go Mach 2, you're like going twice as fast as the air, as the air can actually produce these waves behind you. And so you would be silent in a lot of uh, cases. If, if a plane is coming towards you at, or a person's running towards you at Mach 2, you wouldn't even hear them. They would actually run past you and you wouldn't hear them until the sound waves caught up and when that sound waves caught up that's a lot of pressure and a lot of energy built up in front of it and that would cause the uh the object to uh like that it would be a, a very large sound now when they were first trying to break the speed of sound it the the, the the rockets and the, the planes that they were finally starting to use, because propeller planes can't really do it. Um, they needed rocket engines, uh, jet engines. And so when they were first doing it, they realized that it became unstable and they thought that we wouldn't be able to break the sound barrier. Um, and then an ingenious person came around and they just said, well, take the wings that were normally outright and just sweep them back. That's why the plane wings are swept back now. They're swept back because that actually stabilizes the plane when you're reaching these supersonic speeds. You don't want to fly at supersonic speeds for long. Um, that's one thing that you definitely don't want to do because it eats up a lot of energy. In order to push through the air at these, at these speeds and break through the air, basically ripping the air apart, it takes so much energy to do that. So you don't want to fly at supersonic speeds for very long because you're just wasting fuel.
Now these pressure waves are actually enough to break windows and things like that. Okay, so um, you know, you're still going to want to look up and maybe write down the definition of what is the sound barrier. You're going to want to write down what supersonic, subsonic, and hypersonic are. These are things you're going to want to look up. And again, that's part of your research assignment that you were given uh, to work on as well. In the next video, we're going to go over a few examples of how to use the equations that we had, namely this one here, talking about the speed of sound using this equation, solving for different variables, and also the Mach number equation. Okay, thank you.